Great lineup today, as Ethan said. Thank you very much to everybody. We're going to start off with um, Courtney Norbury. Um, I met Courtney oh, at least 10 years ago when we were both doing our PhDs. Or more, more, I think, um, <laughs> when Courtney was doing her PhD with Dorothy. She's now at Royal Holloway and she's done lots of great research into the nature of SNI and ASD and the overlaps between them. But she's always very grounded in her clinical roots as a speech and language therapist. She's just started a large epidemiological study involving all the five-year-olds in Surrey, or as many as she can get hold of, to see what's um, looking at the nature of language impairment and other co-occurring disorders so that she can actually see what happens over time in a whole population. So it's a really exciting study and we're looking forward to seeing some results, but it hasn't started quite yet. So, but today she's going to talk about criteria for communication disorders and particularly the new DSM criteria that they're working on in the state at the moment. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. So when Susan and I start talking about this, we up and have a moan about the difficulties we have in our respective careers. So Susan, trying to get kids into more house, and people often saying things like, well, their IQs are a little bit less, and maybe they don't need to go to somewhere like more house. And I'm getting papers rejected for the same reason, so your SI group, they're a little bit low on nonverbal IQ, they're not really language impaired, and we're very frustrated by this. Because actually, if you try to find a set diagnostic criteria for language impairment, you can't do it. So we've been talking for a long time about how we might try and get some consensus in the field about what that's about. So then um, DSM-5 changes, and when we started talking about this workshop, this is what was being proposed, that there would be a distinction between a language impairment generally and a specific language impairment, and that there would be the introduction of a new disorder social communication disorder. And this is all very interesting, particularly because um, there's 13 people on the working panel for DSM. Eight of them specialize in autism. There's only one speech and language therapist on the team, and she specializes in autism too. So there wasn't really very good representation of children with communication disorders who didn't have autism. So I was a little bit cross about that, actually. Um, so really, when Susan invited me, it was to talk about nonverbal IQ. Of course, since then, things have changed. Now the proposal is to have communication disorder, which would include language impairment, social communication disorder, and speech sound disorder. I'm not going to talk about speech sound disorder. I'm just going to concentrate on these two. So as it currently stands, and they're inviting public comments, so one of the things we're hoping to do today is to organize our comments so we can discuss this uh, with the DSM people. But language impairment would be persistent difficulties in the acquisition and use of spoken, written, or signed language, and it would include any of these things individually or in any combination. There is no nonverbal criteria specified at the moment, but my understanding is they want to have a rider that's um, similar to this, so not accounted for by general impairments in, in cognitive ability. <laughs> um, and they've specified that it has to have a functional impairment that so interferes with your social relationships with academic attainment employment. Mm -hmm. Social communication disorder <coughs> would be persistent difficulties in pragmatics or the social use of verbal and nonverbal communication and the core deficits are in narrative, expository and conversational discourse. <coughs> the interesting things that they want to say about social communication disorder is that these are not accounted for by impairments in cognitive ability in structural language, so word knowledge and grammar, and not associated with the restricted um, range of interests and behaviours that you would see in autism. So a lot more exclusionary criteria for social communication disorder. And of course results in a functional impairment. That's kind of it for the criteria, um, which is challenging. So one of the things that I, some of the things that I thought I would um, bring up is there's no longer a distinction between expressive and receptive language disorders. So they all kind of come together. And there's no specification of a core deficit. So it just can be any of those things that were on that list. And the evidence that they've put forward for this comes largely from Bruce Tomlin's work. He did a big population study in Iowa 
And basically, when they did various language tests, they found that it didn't really matter, that they all kind of load onto a single language factor. So there wasn't really a need to pull apart receptive and expressive. And I guess in practical terms, it's rare to see kids with isolated deficits, although you do, um, in clinical practice, I guess you can see kids who have more expensive expressive difficulties and receptive difficulties. And I guess one thing that I do really like about this is that I think it's important to assess comprehension. So I think sometimes when people are pushed for time, kids come in, they're not saying very much, you think, yeah, expressive language is fine, don't really look at comprehension. And actually, I think it's really important that it always gets assessed. The other thing that I wanted to note, particularly in the context of how you get provision for children, is that they're introducing these um, severity specifiers you can say that a child has a language disorder, but the clinician would also need to say how severe that disorder is. And the, there's some, some more information under this, but basically level three requires very substantial support, level two just substantial <laughs> support, and level one is just support. And so I thought one of the things um, to think about is what this would mean. So presumably substantial support would be community SLT coming in on a fairly regular basis. Whereas uh, for people at Morehouse and places like Morehouse, I guess you have to specify what that very means. So what is it that you can provide in a special school that you can't get anywhere else? <clears throat> Just something to think about. Okay, so the role of nonverbal general cognitive ability. I think this statement is pretty problematic because it doesn't say what they mean by low ability. And in fact, nowhere in the developmental disorders are they actually putting IQ criteria on, so it's kind of up to you to decide what low ability means. Now, in language disorders, it's pretty tricky because it means different things to different people. So the problem that I often have in my research is that we see kids who have IQs between 70 and 85, so between minus one and minus two standard deviations, and reviewers will say that that's not language impairment, that you can't give them a language impairment uh, diagnosis. And that to me seems a bit bonkers for lots of different reasons. <coughs> but I do think that um, if the IQ is such that a child meets criteria for intellectual disability, which is usually more than two standard deviations below the mean, that should be their primary diagnosis. But that doesn't mean children don't have language impairments as well or that they shouldn't be addressed. Um, but I don't think that things in that kind of no man's land range should necessarily be used as exclusionary criteria. Um, and there's a few reasons why. The first is that I just think it's a massive assumption that the low ability is causing the language problem. Um, we don't know that. Uh, I suspect <coughs> that um, it's equally probable that if you have difficulties with language, that might be causing you to have lower scores on nonverbal assessment because language is a great problem-solving tool. I also think that if you think about neurobiological development, it could be that whatever is causing the child to have low cognitive ability is also causing the child to have low language ability. So they're related, but they might not be causally related. This is some data from Dorothy's studies, <laughs> actually going back a few years. You have to like look at different papers to pull it apart, but basically I went to Bishop <laughs> Edmondson, 19. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think that was the eight-year-old ones, and then this is, uh, the 15 was the Stossard ones. And basically, this is a study following kids from preschool into teenagerhood. Um, and I just looked where the kids have had the same test at two time points. So this is the WISC. And these were kids who had language impairment um, when they were in preschool, but by eight they looked fine. These were kids who had uh, language impairment in preschool and still had language impairment when they got to school at eight. And these were kids who had generally <coughs> depressed cognitive abilities. Um, and these were their scores on block design when they were eight, and this is 15. And this is picture completion at eight, and picture completion at 15. And you can see that they're all going in a slightly downward uh, direction. These are standard scores. So I don't think that means they're losing cognitive skills over time. I think it just means they're not keeping up with their peers and not using language as a problem-solving strategy. So this is difficult. Um, there's a new paper coming out from Gina conti Ramsden's group which looked at all the kids in language units from seven now to adulthood. 
and they're kind of showing similar things. So one thing they're showing is that overall nonverbal <coughs> IQ tends to be quite stable over time, but there are a proportion that have these declining profiles. Okay. Um, and also that it's linked to verbal ability. So those who have the most severe language impairments tended to have the lowest nonverbal IQ scores. And also, how often do you speech therapists assess nonverbal IQ? Sometimes we just don't know. Um, I'm going to skip through literacy because 10 minutes goes fast. <laughs> um, but I'm going to talk about why I think, why I'm not sure about the need for a social communication uh, disorder diagnosis. So one reason is that kids with structural language difficulties have problems with pragmatics. Every study I do demonstrates that. As it currently stands, um, if pragmatic language and discourse <coughs> is included individually or in combination, then it's kind of covered by language disorders, and I'm not sure how you would distinguish them between language disorders and social communication disorders. <coughs> don't really have good gold standard assessments of these pragmatic language skills, which I think is problematic. Um, and there's changing weight of language, social communication, and autism behaviors over time. The other thing is my, <laughs> I tried to find this group of children for my um, doctoral thesis, and I failed miserably. Um, and this is just a flow chart showing we had, um, actually we had 103 children to start with, six were excluded because of IQ. Basically, when you get to the bottom line, I only found four kids who actually fit that profile once you took developmental um, information into account. So either they're very rare or their difficulties don't have that functional impairment and they can cope with mainstream. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I think we should just have one category language disorders but really specify the profile of impairment the child has at the particular point they receive that diagnosis and then specify the associated difficulties. A very simple solution, but one that I think could work, and one that's being put forward for specific learning difficulties. So instead of dyslexia, dyscalculia, they can have one category of specific learning disorders, and then it's up to you to specify what the current presentation is. And actually, I think we need to get pretty good at measuring this functional impairment, because I think in terms of intervention, that's where we make most difference, and we're not very good at measuring it at the moment. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs>